uh, Bill's attempt to explain briefly First Peter Sunday. I felt compelled to address First Peter. Not that he said anything wrong, he just didn't say anything. I'm sorry, but uh, uh, I really felt compelled to uh, address First Peter. And I, I'm going to do it. First Peter, chapter one. I will admit that I have addressed First Peter before. It used to be in Altoona that my associate pastor, our associate pastor, would do what Bill does, and then I would come back and teach the book he would give and what Bill did was to give you a brief overview uh, of the chapter and I want to be a little bit more comprehensive tonight there's so much that I feel needs to be said we come again tonight First Peter chapter 1 verse 1 and 2. Let's read the verses 1 and 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontius, Galatia, Capitonia, Asia, Galatia, which is in modern Turkey, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Dorothy, will you lead us in our opening prayer, please? Dear Lord, we thank thee for everything you give us and everything you do for us. Bless this message tonight, dear Lord, and help that it will be such hard. Forgive us for we fail thee. Bless Charles. Be with him as he brings the message. We thank thee for all things. In Jesus' name, amen. If anything tonight, I want you to write down the verses that I give you. I have five pages of verses that's written out that I want you to have available to you and be sure to write these verses down as I come to them tonight. So from the verse so from the verse starts Peter I am in reading the New Testament through in 30 days and I am now in my fourth day of the book of Matthew listening to it been read and I'm amazed how many times Peter's name has been brought up. Peter was on the front lines with God, with Jesus Christ. I could, but I'm not tonight, spend a whole lesson on Peter. Peter, the author of this tremendous book. So from this verse... Peter entered from the very first verse, Peter enters into a deep theological concept of this letter. The lesson for us tonight is going to be deal with the subject of election or being chosen by God. Now, we need to introduce this subject. I know that we've discussed this previous but I want to put it into context. I did not print it. It's up in the foyer. Is we have this picture of God looking down and grabbing a person out to be saved. I want to share with you tonight, with this lesson in the weeks to come, 
and I'm only going to do chapter 1, why Peter used this doctrine of election at this particular time. Too often we see it out of context. I want to share with you tonight why this subject was so very important to the people in these five churches, in these five, in these five cities with all these churches. I will not be able to complete this lesson or this message tonight, and you will need to hear next week's message to have the whole picture. So you need to have both parts to have the whole picture of this doctrine. Don't form your opinion until you hear the whole story. I then will show you a particular application and the necessity of an understanding of this doctrine, not only for those who are saved, but for those who are not saved. A.W. King, the gift of theologian, who died in 1952 once began a sermon by saying this, I am going to speak tonight on one of the most hated doctrine of the Bible, namely that of God's sovereign election. He's truly right. Yeah. This is a hated doctrine. And he wrote this, quote, God's sovereign election is the truth most lost, hated, and reviled by the majority of those who claim to be believers. Let it be plainly announced that salvation originally originated not in the will of man, but in the will of God. He goes on to say that if it were not so, none would ever be saved. For as a result of the fall, he goes on to say, man has lost all desire and will until that which is good and even the elect themselves have to be made willing to be willing to want to be saved. Now the point of what he is saying is this. It is hard for some people to accept the biblical doctrine of sovereign election. It is hard for man to acknowledge the fact that his salvation is an act of God. In his fallenness, he wants to assume some responsibility even if it's just a small responsibility for having to believe it. Even if it's just a small seed of faith, fallen man wants some credit for this act of his salvation, for having made a right choice. I chose God to be saved. That's what men want to say. It's pride. Men say, well, I got saved. I asked Jesus to come into my heart. I got baptized. I responded to Christ. They want to say, I had something to do with it. The doctrine of election seems repulsive to us because it is our standard. It seems so unfair that God should out of human beings in the world choose some at his own will to be saved and not the rest. It just seems unfair, right? right. But you understand, but what you don't understand, that the reason why men desperately want a part is because in his fallenness, he wants to exercise his pride. It, see, it, it, then, it then is only an expression of his fallenness to have that point of view. What about the part of being unfair? We did that on Sunday, Wednesday and Sunday night. What about being unfair? Is God unfair? 
Is God unfair? No, God is never to be measured. Remember this, God is never to be measured by any human standard. Certainly not by the standard of fairness that the world has, which is also a reflection of man's fallenness. What I think is fair that happens is my standard and my fallenness. It just isn't fair that this happened to me. By whose standard? Your standard. And your standard is a fallen nature. Are we so foolish to assume that we who are fallen, sinful creatures have a high, have a high standard of what is right than an unfallen, unknowing, eternal, holy God? What kind of pride is that if we think that our standard is higher than God's? Therein, therein lies the real problem. Psalms chapter 50 in verse 21. Psalms chapter 50 in verse 21. Here's what it says. Psalms 50 verse 21. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such as one as thyself, but I will reprove thee and set them in order. There are some people that actually believe that they are on the same level that God is. Mark that verse. Scripture warns us not to assume the idea that what we believe is the standard whereby God moves and functions. It says in Psalms 97, verse 2, write down the verse, Psalms 97, verse 2, Righteousness and justice, or judgment, are the, fundamental, uh, are the foundation of His throne. The very thing that sets God is God, that His throne is righteous and justice. That is to say, whatever God does, proceed from the basic of righteousness and justice. It, 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 may, it, it may not be human righteousness or human justice, but it is divine. God never makes a wrong decision. Well, that was just not fair. We say that every single day. Every single day, I bet you that one, you, one, at some point, that just wasn't fair. And we assume that if I think it's unfair, we assume that, that God is unfair because we measure God by our human fairness. Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 9. Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 9. Let's look at it. Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 9. For as the heaven are higher than the earth... God. So are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Do you see that in Isaiah 55, verse 9? Look at it. I want you to grasp the truth here. Here is the point. Heaven is higher than earth. God is higher than you. God's ways are higher than your ways. And His thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And you cannot even begin to put your thoughts into God's thoughts. And you can't say, God, here's what I think. You should, you should listen to it. Folks, we are in no position as fallen creatures to determine what God does is just or right or fair. Put it down somewhere. Just put it in the frame of your mind. It is not for you to question God's decision, what He does and what He doesn't do. Romans 11.33 Romans 11.33